the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be true. And it is not a question of a little occultism or a touch of mysticism, Mr. Dan. It is vampires. It's a host of damned souls and vampires. The old gods aren't dead. And what of the true god? Well, he's dead. Can't complain. People assume that time is a strict progression of cause to effect, but actually, from a non-linear, non-subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff. You're listening to Paranormal UK Radio. Welcome to Paranormal UK Radio, the flagship show of the Paranormal UK Radio Network. I'm your host, Irene Allen Block, and with me tonight is Mark Johnson. I was going to say, say it, say it, Mark, Mark. Mark Johnson, nearly said Mickey. (laughs) <laughs> well, I don't know why I nearly said Mickey, but I nearly said Mickey. <laughs> it's like, Mark Mark sounds like a dog with a hair lip. Yeah, well, the, anyway, with me tonight is this bloke I'm always with. Uh, him over the waters. Okay? <laughs> is that all right, Mark? The strange little man across the pond. Yeah, that's my little pain in the jacksie. Mm-hmm. Okay. That goes, trust me, babe, that goes both ways. Yeah, all right, then. Well... I'll sort you out later on. <laughs> try it. Just try it. Right. Oh, how was your week? I wanna, oh, go on then. Go on then. I, I want to say you... a few things. Okay, so, you say a on. few things first. Go ahead. Right. Saturday night, I went to see Russell Watson at the Swansea Grand Theatre, and he uh, he blew my mind when he sang Phantom of the Opera. Wow. That man can sing. And uh, I, I'm not as familiar with him. Is he an opera singer? Well, he, he does both. Well, he does everything. He does everything. But he is brilliant. He, he is absolutely brilliant. You see, when he sings opera, I love it. You know? But he was ill a, car, a few years back. He's had a, a tumor, op, uh, an operation for a tumor. And then uh, he was clear for a little while, and that tumor came back. So he has to be careful when he's singing opera. So he, you know, but it is it's fantastic, absolutely fantastic, and it was a good night, really good night. Well, good. So that's the first thing. And the second thing I want to say is Deborah McKenzie in Scotland. Hello, Deborah right? McKenzie. So that was the second thing. Deborah McKenzie, yeah, same clan as me, McKenzie. Okay. And uh, that was the second thing. And the third thing, doesn't matter what's going on between Russia and the UK at the moment, I want to say, send my prayers and my thoughts to all those people and their families that have just been involved in the sh- big fire in the shopping mall in Siberia. Let me see if I can pronounce this place. Kemerova. In Kimilova, in Siberia, I more than likely pronounced it wrong, but there's over 60 people lost their life, mainly children, because today was the first day of the school holidays and this shopping mall had put on a lot of um, activities for children. So a hell of a lot of children were killed in this fire. Oh, no. People just couldn't get out. The, the fire exits were locked. For some reason, I don't know whether this is true or not, for some reason, the um, when whoever it was that heard about it, that operates the tannoy in the shopping mall, they switched the tannoy off. So the people were just trapped, literally trapped. Hmm. It's a terrible disaster. So whatever's going on with their countries, bugger it. I feel so sorry for those people, and my prayers go out to them. Mine too. That's that's terrible yeah. here, and, and you know yeah. what? For for some people, to, and again, I'm not going to get political here. I'm just going to say one thing: is that I do not feel, and I really am disgusted with what's going on right now with uh, my country in general, uh, trying to make. Russia back into an enemy and into the new Cold War. It's like 
this this is getting so ridiculous. The they, the Russians haven't done anything. The, this is American politics at work, and yet they keep spinning this stuff. And now there's the latest of these supposed poisonings in London. I mean, in the UK, and it just smells so fishy to me. And Salisbury, yeah, it, it, mm. it it's just so fishy to me that so much is going on, and yet I just. I can't buy it. What is Russia going to do? They're not in a position to take over the world. They're not in a position to do anything really of any harm. And yet we still keep trying to pretend this is the 1960s. And, you know, the the Russian people are good people. They are. are, There's a lot of good people in Russia. Yeah. But, you know, I can't really say whether they done it or they didn't do it. I don't know. And... um, yeah, it's hard you know, to I'm my position I can't get involved in that. No, sort of no. Anyway. I know you can't talk, but you know what it's just I mean, we don't need this right now, okay? We don't need no. with everything else that's going crazy, we don't need to be fanning the flames of a new cold war. It's stupid. No, we don't. So, we and don't. that's my and, You know, today so many countries, the last uh, last time I looked at the television, I think it was 19 countries that expelled ambassadors. 19, with uh, 60 being expelled from the United States and one of your embassies being completely shut down. I can't remember which one it is now. I did tell you earlier on. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah what, one in Seattle, I think. Yeah, that was it, the Seattle yeah. one. Yeah, uh, it's getting crazy out there. But you know what? We have our listeners there in Russia as well as in countries all over the world. We and, do. We have quite a lot of listeners in Russia. We, in in Russia, in Asia, in South America, and Australia. We have, yeah. If you go to our website at um, at paukradio dot com, we actually have a little world map, and everywhere you see a, a red dot spinning, that's where people have tuned in. Uh, we've had Malaysia, Vietnam. Uh, I, w- I wouldn't go on that red map so much. It's oh, really? What's going through the stats? Oh, uh, okay. It is. It's what we're picking up in the stats more so than that little world thing well and you know i still get the biggest chuckle out of the fact that we have not one but two two <laughs> yeah, listeners two now in north, in north korea so that must mean you know kim jong-un and his wife listen to our show or his sister <laughs> or his sister or somebody else high up in the government certainly not <laughs> the public well as someone that's got a computer anyway well, you know, rest assured, we are we are professionals on this program. Which we never want to insult anybody, so we'll never call him a little fat man. You know, we won't no, do that. no, we would never call him a little no, fat man. No. Uh, a homicidal fat oh, man? Well, no. Pickles no. would. Pickles yeah, Pickles would. would. Oh, yeah, Pickles man. is mean. He would definitely be calling people names if he could speak. Yeah. Well, he can speak. He is a parrot. Yeah, so Kim Jong, whatever your name is. We don't call you a little fat man. No, not a little man. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, but not a little fat man. Yep, a little dumpy one, maybe. Little, yeah. little. You know what? What little men also have? You little... know, there's going to be a hit out on us now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> my my car is going to blow up in my driveway now. Oh God, yeah. I'll have rice in my in my uh, morning coffee. Yeah, you will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, so uh, that's, that's me done. What about you? Has anything happened with you that's been good? No? No, waiting for this weather to finally break and to get out and start. I'm I'm getting really antsy. I need to get out and start doing some investigations, uh, get some things lined up, and, uh, and uh, cause some trouble. Oh, you need to get out on your motorbike. Oh, yeah. Uh, Need to get out on your motorbike, get some fresh air, feel that vibration between your legs as you go through the countryside. Yep, take some nice, long country scenic rides. I don't ride fast. I like going slow and running through the mountains. I won't even get on the highways. Do you go more than 50 miles an hour, Mark? What a waste. You miss the scenery that way. Do you go? Oh, no, these back roads, 30 to 40. I mean, I get up to 50 sometimes, but I don't like well, going no, really f- speed. I, I've been on the interstate and I've gone like 70 and it scares the living crap out of me because with <laughs> all the cars around you, you never know when some idiot is not going to see you and change lanes and hit you. And let's face it, at that speed, you're done. I'll tell you what. 
I totally agree with you. You know, motorbikes are so easy. There's so many accidents with motorbikes. But when I was a rocker, believe it or not, people, I was a rocker. I was at Brighton at the Mods and Rockers thing. Anyway, we used to hang out at Chelsea Bridge and we used to do wheelies over the bridge. Right, and I'd be a pillion passenger, and we'd go as fast as we can over the bridge. And there was always traffic. There was traffic lights at the other side, the end of the bridge. And if they were red, you were dead. I tell you. <laughs> and somehow you survived. Oh, we survived. Uh, it was all the bacon sandwiches that used to get over Chelsea Bridge, I think, <laughs> and sausage sandwiches. But um, anybody that's an old biker that. Uh, used to hang out at Chelsea Bridge and know about the sausage sandwiches. Sausage sandwich, cup of tea, and a wheelie over the bridge. Nice. Yeah. Sounds like fun. Yeah. yeah, it was fun. It was very good fun. But I wouldn't do it now, obviously, and anybody, if I was to see anybody do it, I'd call them a bloody idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've seen, well, you know, I've seen... <laughs> No, I don't want to go to that. Mm-hmm. I, I, I saw somebody doing wheelies once and then a few minutes passing me doing wheelies and then about 10 minutes later I come around the curve and there he is wiped out dead on the side of the road. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember you saying about that. Yeah, that wasn't very fun. No. Nope, no, nope, nope. See, it is so drive carefully on your motorbike. That is, and always, if you're driving a car, just Ask remember helmet. you can't usually see the bikes. Look out for them. Yeah. Save a biker's life today. Mm-hmm. Save a biker's life. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So. Right. Shall so we get, where are we then? Shall we get on with the show then? Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do, do that. Want to introduce our guest? Yes. I will have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dave yeah. Barnett is our guest okay. tonight. Uh, Dave okay. is also known as Dave the Mystic. And... Uh, Dave, I'm looking forward to talking with this gentleman tonight because he is not only dealing a lot with uh, spiritual healing, he is also an honest-to-goodness rocket scientist. Dave, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's great to be on. Wow, Dave, rocket scientist. Do you know something? I joined the Wrens when I left school. And you had to choose three things that you wanted to do in the Wrens, which is Women's Navy. Okay. Okay. One of them, one of them, was a lorry driver, which is a bus driver. One, if, you, if you don't know the English, uh, yeah, truck driver, uh-huh. lorry driver. One was a mechanic, and the other one was a rocket researcher. <laughs> wow! <laughs> and, and let's guess which one you got. Uh, none of them, because I bottled out with. The, I had one week to think about whether I was definitely going in or not, and I lost it in that week and ended up working for an, another organisation further down the road. Ah, so yeah, more important organisation, but still, <laughs> there you go. Now, now, Dave, let me ask you before we get into your other work. I, I do have to ask: when you hear the term, somebody says they're a rocket scientist. Um, from from your perspective in your case, what does that mean? Now, I deal a lot. Uh, I have a human resources job during the day. I do a lot of hiring, and I'm going to assume that a lot of times when you're dealing with people uh, in rocket science, you're dealing with a lot of engineers, uh, the chemical, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, uh, other types of engineering positions. Uh, where do you fit in with that in your career? Well, I have a bachelor's and a master's in electrical engineering, and um, I came out of school. uh, I went to grad school in Michigan and started at General Motors and worked at their proving grounds where they test cars. And I found that I really didn't care for Michigan in the long-term perspective uh, due to the weather, and I didn't care for what I saw in GM management. So. I moved back to Wichita and took a job with Boeing. And with Boeing, I was working on uh, electronics and test sets for the early cruise missile program when cruise missiles were first coming out. Um, Boeing started talking about wanting to relocate all of us down to Huntsville, Alabama, and I didn't want to go there. And Mark Marietta came through town, and um, I hopped on that bus and moved from Wichita out to Denver. And I was involved. Uh, the first job was on the MX missile. Um, 
you could say rocket scientists. You know, sci- science is proving the original principles, but engineers are the ones who put the stuff out there and make it work on a day-to-day basis. So uh, a scientist may come up with a unique way to do something with DNA, but if he wanted to produce uh, pills or injections for you know hundreds of thousands of people to take, then it would be chemical engineers who would come up with the production methods to mass produce that and put it into a form that could be used for the public. So the same thing uh, early on, you would say maybe Robert Goddard, who did the first early 1900s uh, rocket testing, was truly a rocket scientist because they're trying to understand their principles. He was still up against people who said that rocket engines would not work in space because there's no air to push against, which betrays uh, a lack of knowledge of uh, Newtonian uh, physics uh, of actions and reactions. Um, but going down the road, in order to perfect rockets with what the Germans had done with the V1 and V2 in World War II, and then that became the, the basis for the space programs, both in Russia or Soviet Union at that time and um, the United States, then you really had teams of engineers who had to look at the principles, the materials, Uh, A rocket doesn't get get to space unless it's extremely lightweight, and trying to find a a way to make it very lightweight is is a challenge. You need the guidance systems and electronics. You need uh, all kinds of control systems and computers, and so it's a big team effort. But there's, uh, there's something about the business that if you don't work in it, if you're an engineer in another area and you come into the rocketry business, satellites, all that type of thing, it's just a whole different mindset and a different set of rules. Um, when you're launching a, a $200 million rocket with a $400 million satellite, you don't mess around with, maybe it's just good enough. Uh, maybe we have some margins there, but I'm not going to bother to calculate them. You really have to go in and exactly know what you're doing. It, it's like the highest tuned sports car and the most expensive sports car, but you have to make it as light as possible and it has to work for, you know, for a rocket to get space, it has to work for 45 minutes, and, and then it's done. And uh, there, there's just no correction. There's no uh, fixing something in flight. Now, once you hit the button, it's either yes or no, and there's nothing in between. There's no partial success on a, on a rocket launch. You, you know, wow. with... <laughs> with, with, with... I, I, I tell you what, I'm glad I wasn't a rocket researcher. <laughs> well, That's you know, way above my head. But see, here's the thing: I'm I'm a, a space geek. Always have been ever since a child. Yeah, and yeah, you should have been sent up there, huh? <laughs> hey, I'm willing to take a ride, but the aliens just keep ignoring me. You know, I tell them get me off this rock. But you, you know, with, with with you know, as a kid following the space program and understanding, you know, the how much the engineers contribute to this type of 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 industry. With you know, if I tell people you want to see what, the one movie where engineers come in and save the day on the true story was the Apollo 13 mission when absolutely that mission was saved. Those astronauts were saved by engineers and they, and just like Matt Damon in the Martian, they science the shit out of it to figure out a way to keep those three men alive uh, until they could stretch it out and bring them home. And uh, a fantastic, you know, the movie is fantastic based on a real story. And it just goes to show you what, you know, with engineers, what they could do. They build the world. So, and they build us also going in towards other worlds, too. So that's always a fascinating subject. Mm -hmm. And and then there's also engineering failures. We had this bridge collapse down in Florida recently. And I'm just waiting to see whether they're going to blame a, a materials malfunction, a construction malfunction, or the fundamental design. Uh, but I, I watch those things, too, because I'm, I'm very sensitive to um, failures, especially in the public domain, um, that, are, that hurt people. I, I'm a licensed professional engineer, and I, I take that stuff quite to heart, that um, we, we just can't tolerate you know, mistakes like that. Right. 
Right. It's, you know, a bridge collapse or uh, there was even, although people thought there might have been a paranormal um, issue behind it, but, you know, the famous uh, bridge outside of Point Pleasant, West Virginia in the 1960s, which failed. And uh, Mm -hmm. a lot of people lost their lives as the bridge collapsed that day. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, those types of failures... um, yeah, they're very. Uh, it's very emotionally disheartening for people. Why mm-hmm. would they think that with this particular bridge there was something paranormal behind it? Well, the Mothman. That's the whole Mothman oh, story. Mothman. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, that's that. He gets about, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. Um. Yeah. But the bridge really collapsed, so you know that's still you could look at yeah, that as I an know, engineering structural failure. Yeah, um, that's a sad event. Well, can I go? Well, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, so how did you get from uh, rocket science to paranormal? That's a great question. Um, uh. Well, I, I look back, I, I was primed to uh, be open to the paranormal. Um, I knew I wanted to be an engineer when I was in the fifth grade, and I started an electrical engineer, and I started uh, actually taking TVs apart, and then uh, in sixth grade, I started building uh, kits that you could order uh, from companies uh, like Knight, and I built a shortwave radio with four tubes uh, from a kit. And that was in sixth grade. So I, I was kind of ahead of the curve for a lot of kids. And uh, I was fixing radios for neighbors and taking apart TVs to salvage the parts. Um, but uh, my parents were divorced when I was in sixth grade. and. Uh, my dad was both an engineer and a Episcopal priest, and he moved out. Um, sometime in that time frame, my mom, just as a lark, went with a friend of hers to get an astrology reading, and she sort of expected one of those, you're going to meet a tall, dark, handsome stranger that looks like the, the ones in the newspaper. Well, she saw an astrologer who started telling her things like, I see you broke your left arm when you were five years old, and uh, you have a, a big mole on your upper right thigh. And oh. all these things that the lady told her were very true, very evidential. And oh. my mom came away with her friend saying, I have to learn how this works. And this was one of the few types of uh, metaphysical training you could get in Wichita, Kansas in the 1960s. There wasn't much else other than the Madame Zelda with the big palm reading sign. And uh, so my mom became an astrologer, and she she uh, continued to take lessons and do uh, readings for most of her life. But she was interested in looking at ESP and things like that when I was in junior high and high school. So I was kind of her, her partner in trying these things. And we did Ouija. We tried table tipping. We did uh, our version of the Rhine cards where you try to predict, you know, which one of five symbols was going to come up, things like that. Yeah. And uh, so I was open. I was open to it. Uh, I had an event in high school that was just one of those things. I look back and say I was getting uh, I was getting primed to do this because um, my my girlfriend in high school, who's now my wife, um, we were there for an evening performance of a play or a musical or something, and we went down to one of the deserted hallways. This is a very big high school. And the hallway we were in was lined with lockers, no other things along the walls, just mm-hmm. for all intents and purposes, smooth walls. And I had one of those little uh, rubber balls about an inch and a half in diameter that's clear with uh, like glitter sparkles in it. And oh, yeah. we were bouncing it back and forth between us. And mm. so I would toss it to her, it would take one bounce, reach her, she'd catch it, bounce it back. One of the times that I bounced it towards her, it didn't make it to her. It 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 blinked out. It, it disappeared. It wasn't the ty- type of thing where it could take an odd bounce and get stuck in a doorway well, or anything. It, it just disappeared it from sight. Completely it disappeared. disappeared. Left our reality. Oh. And, and so I, I just kind of filed that away as like, wow, this is kind of odd. This is kind of weird. <laughs> and yeah. uh, it, it was things like that, that that kind of got me primed. Another one that kind of got me primed before the big event happened for me in 1983 was um, I had a feeling uh, when I was going up to interview with General Motors, um, it was like I'd either had a dream or or something, but what it had done is it had planted the 
information in me of the building I was going to be in. And I didn't realize that until I got to the building where I was interviewed at GM. And when we walked in, I knew how to find my way. I led the, the guy who was there with me down to the office, through hallways and stuff, where I was supposed to go, because I'd already been there somehow. And, yeah. and that was another one of those data points. And, you know, sometimes I say, well, well, deja vu is just kind of like losing track of when you knew something, and so it seems like you predicted it. But this one, I'd never been there before, and I knew my way around, and that to me was pretty remarkable. Mm. So that was a, that was another one I, I stored in my interesting events in my life. But the the, the big one for me... Uh, 1983. So I, yeah, I, I'd come out to Denver in 81 to start working for Martin Marietta, and in 1983... I went back to uh, Wichita for my 10th high school reunion. And I ran into an old friend there, and I hadn't seen him or stayed in contact with him since graduation. But at that point, he had already been working on becoming a, a disc jockey. He had a brother in the business who got him in part-time and then became a full-time job. But he, he catches up with me, and he says, Dave, did you become an electrical engineer like you expected? And I said, yeah. And he goes, I've got something for you. He said, do you think it's possible to change things at a distance? And he kept beating around the bush. He wouldn't lay it out for me. And I finally said, okay, come on, what's going on? He said, well, after this lunch is over, let's go to my house. I want to show you some things. So we go over to his house and pull up in the car, get out of the car, walk over to the outside wall of the house where his electric meter was. And it has one of the rotating wheels that uh, meters the electricity and drive us little pointers for uh, measurement. And he said, do you have an idea of the rate of that wheel? And I look at it and say, yeah. And he kind of points at it with his right index finger and says, now. It slows by a third. And it's very obvious. It wasn't just something that switched off inside. There's nobody inside. I've got, I'm tempted to say that. That's one way of fixing your meter, isn't it? <laughs> to get yeah, that. well, he... He told me, he said, I, I did this to my mother's house several months ago, and her bills are still lower. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> please come do it to my house. But, uh, you know, so I'm an electrical engineer, and he's showing this to me. So we go inside. He has mm. a little black and white TV with rabbit ears. Um, he puts the TV onto a, a channel with no station. It's just snow. He points at the TV, and he goes, now. He tunes in a channel. It comes in just clear. It's like, wow, okay, uh, what else? And, you know, I'm starting to feel the hair come up on the back of my neck a little bit because it's one thing to think about these things hypothetically. It's another to see somebody who can really do it. And uh, we went over to a stereo, and he's really big on uh, everything in sound and vibration since he was a disc jockey. And he had a very high-quality stereo, and it had the – the VU needles on it to show the, the sound intensity on the left and the right meters. And he said, do you have an idea of how the, the needles are going with the music? And I said, yeah. And he points out, he goes, now, and the needles went 180 degrees out of phase. So if they're supposed to go up with louder music, now they're going down with louder music. It's mm. like, wow, this is remarkable. And did, it, did he well, use the word time, now every time he done something? Yes, and, and I'll explain that in a minute because there's an obvious question that people have asked me about him because I, I don't reveal his identity. I'm I'm one of only about 10 people he's ever shown this to. Mm. And uh, we went out to his car, and he set it on idle, and it was conventional ignition. And he goes, you ready? And I said, yeah. And he goes, now. And he could slow down the idle to the point where the car would stall. And he said, I can stall other cars in traffic. Uh, wow, this is pretty remarkable. But uh, here's the the big uh, the icing on the cake. We went down to his radio station. There's an FM radio station, uh, 50,000 watt output power. And if you know anything about radio, to to send 50,000 watts out of an antenna, you probably need at least 100,000 watts of total power in the transmitter to make that happen because of inefficiencies. And we're looking at. Um, status board and it had a meter on it that was a digital meter and it indicated the percentage of output power currently and it was at 99.6 percent 
He said, uh, watch the meter, because he said, I can't lower it too much. I'll trip the station off the air, and I've done that before. So I said, okay, it's at 99.6%, and he goes, now, and it drops to 99.2%. Well, that's four-tenths of a percent of 100,000 watts that he controlled with his mind. So, okay, well, I, so I, hang on. Quite I, remarkable. <laughs> uh, we have to apologize for that. That's um, Gertie snoring. <laughs> our, oh, our our mascot. Sorry. Yeah, I've been trying to. I've been texting Irene like mute. <laughs> Gertie is <laughs> is really snoring. It's a, it's a British bulldog. Uh, she's our mascot, oh, okay. and sometimes she sleeps during our show. So <laughs> you're not, we're not. No, it's not any ghosts or ghoulies or anything coming out. But uh, the, but that leads me into a question. Um, the, this what he was doing. Uh, I'm intrigued by from an electromagnetic perspective, being able to affect. It almost sounds like he's able to affect magnetic fields. Uh, magnetic fields, but also electronics. We tested it long distance. He feels that he can change anything that has a pattern to it. And uh, so one time I was in my kitchen in Denver. I have a ceiling fan that was out of balance, so it, it has one of those wobbles to it. And I was telling him about it. He said, tell you what, Dave. He said, tap on the phone on the pace of the wobble, and let me see if I can change that. And I did, and sure enough, he balanced it out. So... You know, that's 500 miles away. Um, you know, the, anything that we found where we, we try waveforms, he's been able to change it. He can change marquee signs on hotels. Uh, we found that he can change traffic light sequences, you know, going down the street when they're put into an order. He, he can change that pattern. Well, my, but, well again, yeah, my, my question on that would be, when did he learn he could do it, and did anything special happen in his life that uh, may have caused this to happen, or is it something that he just realized it was an ability he had? He told me that one evening he was smoking marijuana, and he was totally relaxed and looking at his stereo, and he just thought about changing something on it, and it changed. And he said, wow, what is going on here? You know, what, what am I smoking? You know, is it really real? And then he found it. It didn't take him. He wanted to do it after that. He he had a realization. But the, when I asked him about it, I said, what are you doing? And he said, you know, it's a funny thing, but the best way I can describe it is I don't think I'm forcing it or making it do something. He said, I feel like I'm letting it do something. And I've read that before with other people who have some of these abilities. And uh, one point of view I could have for sort of explaining in that gray area between uh, our reality and that reality that's explained by quantum mechanics is um, I think in some way he may be changing the probability of something happening where the probability is almost non-existent that, for example, the TV would tune in a snow channel into a station. Um, from his point of view or what he's doing, maybe he's changing the probability from 0.00001% to 99.9%. And so suddenly something in the TV changed and is now tuning in that station. Uh, something like that. So that that's one possibility. I don't know how you would test that. Uh, he's tried it on a lot of things and he's generally had good success. His, his only uh, weird thing is he said every once in a while he would try it on something and it would go the opposite direction that he expected. So if he wanted something to go down, whatever down means, it went up instead. Hmm. But that's, uh, he, he's had very good success with it. So the word now, is it like a trigger word to him? Mentally, tri it's like a trigger word? I don't know. I, I don't know if it's for me when he just wanted to indicate that he was turning on the the, the woo-woo juice to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And so he would say now, so I, I knew, or he'd point at it. But um, that, that may have been a, a little bit of a conditioned reflex in him. But, you know, I don't think the magic's in his finger. I don't think the magic's in the word now. It's somehow he is altering our reality. Okay, very handy man to have about. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah I'm, 
I, I was impressed. But, mm. but that was, uh, I came back to Denver from that trip, and I felt, and I was getting intuitive hits that, you know, somebody in the spiritual plane, very high, had set this up for me precisely because I'm an electrical engineer, and that would be something I knew he couldn't fake, and uh, I would be able to agree with it and buy into it that I'd seen something pretty remarkable, and uh, in no way can I see any way to uh, claim it was fraud or debunked or that I was taken in. Uh, he just, he wasn't that kind of person. And uh, so I came back to Denver, and I said, I've got to dig into this. And it was just a, a real change in direction in my life. So you know, I continued being an electrical engineer, a rocket engineer, but I started taking classes in meditation. I took a whole long program in therapeutic touch and the energy healing program. And I also got involved with a group called the Tibetan Foundation, which was here for a couple of years, where they taught channeling and working with ascended masters. So I was trying all this stuff. I was I got very fascinated with it. The meditation, some of that that I tried formally didn't click because I wasn't ready for the the Eastern guys in the orange robes, frankly. Um, so that that didn't click, but the the energy healing certainly did. And uh, so I did a lot of energy healing, but main, mainly family, friends, and uh, close contacts uh, up through about 1998, 1999. It was uh, a little bit careful in the 80s and early 90s to not go out and announce that Dave, the electric, electrical engineer, was doing hands-on healing. That, that just uh, I, I really kind of maintain that separateness uh, from my, my daily work as an engineer and what I was doing on the side. So, um, and, and even today, I, I still keep that somewhat separate. You, um, you know, Dave the Mystic or Mystic Dave on Facebook is different than Dave the Electrical Engineer on LinkedIn. And so I have two different networks there. Go there was a CEO in California at one of the computer companies, mm. and he got booted when they found out he was doing hands-on healing to fix computers, and he he made it work. It was good. It worked for him. But that's not what the board of directors wanted to hear, and uh, they threw him out. Well, that's silly, isn't it? Because obviously that was going to be a cheaper way for them. Yeah, <laughs> you, you'd think so. <laughs> yeah. Some people haven't got intelligence, have they? You know, I'd grab that one. <laughs> okay, you do your mm -hmm. healing with your hands. <laughs> so, so you've been doing this type of healing work yourself for how many years now, since, since the, the mid-'80s? Oh, gosh, about 35 years now, yeah. Why do you think that hasn't caught on in Western medicine, if it is that effective? Why, why do you think that we're still, we're so in the uh, scientific stone age of focusing on pharmaceuticals and, and other physical means of trying to cure uh, diseases or injuries rather than using this type of energy work, which, which uh, seems to be proving effective? I think there's several things going on here. Uh, first off, though, I would say that I do run into a lot of millennial, no, I'm sorry, not millennials, uh, baby boomers in that age range who are very interested in it because many of them have gone down the path or seen friends go down the path where you have a condition and the doc gives you drug A and drug A works pretty well, but you get a couple side effects. So they give you drug B to control the side effects from drug A. And then pretty soon you find you're getting drug C to control the side effects of drug B, and soon you find you're paying $800 a month for prescriptions, most of which are just treating the symptoms of other drugs, not the original condition. So I do think we're, we're getting a lot of people in that age range who uh, are tired of the side effects uh, of a lot of these things, and they're tired of the costs. The costs are excessive, you know, especially in retirement. So I think they're more open to it than a lot of the other groups. I'd say a lot of people are still looking for the quick fix. You go to the, the guy in the white coat, he says, well, you've got A, B, and C. Let me give you this drug. Should take care of it. And there's an awful lot of the placebo effect in that that it probably will work. And uh, they've shown that so many times. You know, one of the, the neat studies they've done is they've taken a whole lot of people who uh, needed arthroscopic knee, knee surgery, 
And they did a controlled study where half the people got real surgery, the other half got sham surgery, where they made the surface cuts and then just stitched them up and they didn't go in with their tools. And the recovery rate was about the same. So your brain can do an awful lot, but if you grew up in a culture where only going to see uh, a doctor, a traditional Western medical doctor, is going to help you, it's very hard to get through that subconscious core belief system that says that anything else will help you. And if it does, it was a fluke. Uh, maybe the diagnosis was originally wrong then because otherwise it wouldn't have gone away, that type of thing. So um, I, I do, I, I'm spoiled here in Denver. Denver is one of the most open places I've found for all of the, the energy medicine, energy healing. Uh, you ask somebody here on the street, you know, uh, do you know what chakras are? Yeah, no problem. They can tell you what they are. A lot of cities you go into and people say, what's a chakra? You know, they have no idea. But Denver is uh, very open to light workers and energy medicine. It's been a, a great environment. Well, I'm also sure that, you know, coming into the, the 20th century, you know, there were so many illnesses throughout the centuries, of, you know, plagues and that have, uh, you know, killed a lot of people, everything from tuberculosis to yellow fever, uh, epidemics. And coming into the 20th century, when new medicines were found that would uh, stop these plagues in his tracks, even the polio vaccine. The the people embrace the scientific aspect of great. Now we have cures for these diseases and we can even prevent them. But yet uh, we're still coming in from a very westernized point of view that ignores the the true benefits of the spiritual healings. You know, they look at it as all mystical bunk uh, fairy tales. It's not you know, scientists don't take it seriously at all, which is a shame because it's actually uh, a process that can be measured. You can measure a healing and see the outcome of it. And they, they may try to say, well, it's, you know, psychosomatic, but at the same time, if it's wielding results, it's certainly worth further study. But. Well, I think a, a couple of key things, because I remember talking to my mom about it and. And, uh, you know, I've read a lot about uh, the history of, you know, Western medicine. Several key events, you know, number one is when they uh, learned how to vaccinate against smallpox by using cowpox. And, you know, that was Jenner. And um, that really got people's attention because, you know, smallpox had been a big killer and, you know, it totally decimated Native American populations in the U.S. and in the Caribbean. Uh, so that was one data point. Another big one was... Uh, the best they could do for uh, cleaning out wounds and infections were early sulfa drugs, which were pretty ineffective. And uh, so when the first antibiotics came out with penicillin, once again, what a major milestone. This is a modern miracle. A lot of people live because of penicillin. And then another one that came out uh, was uh, the antipsychotic drugs, which came out of German uh, chemical research where they they found that certain dyes would stain neurons or brain cells. And then they found, well, if we could tie that dye to something that worked with neurotransmitters, and suddenly they had another miracle where it looked like they could help people out of their madness. And so that was another big one. And then the other vaccinations came along for measles and mumps and rubella and uh, polio. My mom still remembers, I, I have three older brothers, she remembers when she heard on the car radio, that they come out with a vaccination for polio, she found the nearest church and went in and thanked God for it with tears streaming down her face because she was so fearful that, you know, some of my brothers might catch polio. And um, that was that big impact. And suddenly you have the image of the, the doctor in the white lab coat being the miracle worker. And miracles just kept coming. Well, you know, these days now... Um, you know, I, I'm very happy that we have trauma centers. If I get hit by a car, you know, I'd rather have an ambulance pick me up than somebody holding a pendulum over me looking at my chakras uh, for that type of treatment, you know, because I don't have time. When I have time, when I have a client with a chronic condition or I have one myself, um, then I have time to work with it and change the consciousness and change the energy and things like that then I'd certainly like to take advantage of it. So um, that's kind of how I, I split those up. But I, 
I also talk to people, I, I teach some classes in advanced healing, and these are classes for healers to help them understand all of the metaphysical reasons behind illness um, that can interfere with the healing process. You know, you, you might get a you know, sad case of an eight or nine year old little kid who's got uh, some type of brain cancer. And then kids' brain cancers are really bad because uh, they grow fast because the kid's brain is growing fast. And so they're very hard to uh, help the kid reach a complete cure. You know, a lot of times they're fatal. But some of these, you end up with um, a child who um, they, they just decide to soldier on with it. And uh, in some cases, they've started um, oh, uh, fundraisers and things for medical research. And they die two years later, and then there's still this uh, big foundation going that has millions of dollars to study that type of cancer to help. Okay, from my point of view, because I do so much with Akashic Records, a lot of those kids came here with that mission to teach a lot of people things and deliberately to have a short life. Uh, if that's in the cards for them, that's their life plan and their life chart. Uh, as a healer, um, you're going to have our time curing them, you know, frankly, or, or giving them uh, treatments that would lead to a cure because it's just not in the cards for them. And you may have to accept that. So, you know, another part of my thing is, you know, don't get ego involved with trying to heal somebody where if they don't heal, you're a failure. You don't know what healing necessarily looks like for them. But uh, overall, um, at least here in this part of the country, we're finding more and more people are willing to do the acupuncture. They're willing to do therapeutic massage. They're willing to consider energy healing in different modalities. Um, they're looking at homeopathic uh, remedies. Uh, all these things and uh, supplements, uh, herbs, uh, essential oils, all those types of things. They're, they're willing to give it a chance if they have a longer condition, and especially you know, for these things where, um, you know, a lot of people think, well, when it has a name, then they know everything about it. And that's not true. You take something like neurofibromyalgia, uh, that's a label, and it's a label based on symptoms. It says nothing about what is the origin. It says nothing that gives you a good indicator on how you can help people. And for a lot of people, the doc says, well, based on all my uh, observations and everything, this is what you have, and here are some painkillers, and we'll keep tuning them, and good luck, and I'll see you in three months. I hope you don't feel too bad. And you know, whereas other forms of uh, healing, you know, energy healing, uh, acupuncture, things like that, uh, look at that totally different. And... Uh, so I know a number of people who use non-traditional med medical techniques to get past uh, fibromyalgia and um, essentially be symptom-free. Uh, okay, traditional medicine would say, well, you got lucky, maybe it was misdiagnosed, blah, 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 all those types of you know, um, CYA statements. Um, whereas you know, some of us just say, well, if you don't get locked into the diagnosis, maybe there's a chance we can change your energies and have you let go of those symptoms. So, um, yeah, I, you know, for some things, Western medicine is great, uh, but other things, then I, I, if I have time, I'm willing to, to certainly try other things if it's not uh, acute or critical. Yeah, I, I'm always fascinated with um, fibromyalgia because they, they have drugs that they advertise on TV. Tell your doctor to prescribe Lyrica. And, and yet, it, even if the commercial, if you look at some of the fine print, they, they even admit they don't know how, what causes fibromyalgia. So why are, you, Absolutely. why are you prescribing a medication to fix fibromyalgia if you don't know what's causing it? And so that makes you wonder, oh. what in the hell is in this pill? Um, it, it scares the crap out of me half the time. The, anytime there's a new pharmaceutical on television where they're telling the patients to go tell your doctor to write this script, like you know more than your doctor, um, so that they can, you know, have good good pharmaceutical sales for the quarter. You know, they got to hit those billions of dollars. That's my cynical side coming out there. Um, and yet they still don't really have a handle on it. Um, so many doctors these days just become pill pushers, and then they wonder why we have an opiate um, epidemic right now. With with um, doing the energy healing, now, when, when did you first start doing the energy healing, and how did that come about for you, and what was your reaction to it when it started to work for you? 
Well, I started that. That was one of the, the paths I chose in 1983. And I was very blessed with an instructor. If, uh, if you know anything about therapeutic touch, it, it's a very um, rigid program that is unchanging and it's inflexible. And you will teach it exactly as Dolores Krieger presented it in her book, or you will not be a therapeutic teacher, a therapeutic touch teacher. However, I had a teacher who disagreed with that. She was in her 50s. She was uh, an RN, and her grandmother had been a Native American healer. So she taught us a whole lot of stuff that wasn't in the standard curriculum. And um, she even did, like, a past life regression meditation with us and things like that. But, you know, being an engineer, I like to see things validated, and I'm still that way. When, when I get information that's uh, surprising or controversial, or uh, forces me to, you know, change my view 15 degrees, uh, I'd like to get validations for it. And she gave them to us in the class. One of the ones that really stands out to me is uh, she would bring in people um, who had a diagnosed condition, but they were going to be a, a blind study for us. And she brought in this one woman who is, you know, 40s or 50s. And as soon as the woman walked in, I immediately had to hit, this is abdominal. And I thought, well, okay, I'll go with that. And then when it's my turn to move my hands over her and pick up what I could, and nobody had revealed what they thought yet, I immediately got transverse colon. And uh, when she, uh, when we had our debrief and she was revealing what she had, um, it was something that maybe today we call it Crohn's disease, uh, or you know, ulcerative colitis or something like that, but she had a diagnosed condition right in her colon, right where I said it was. And it's like, wow, jeepers, you know, I, I could have guessed anything for her uh, because she didn't come in in distress. You know, she just came in and, you know, essentially gave us her name and said hi. And uh, that was very reassuring to me in terms of this stuff really does, uh, does work. And then the, the second one in the class that happened to me that was uh, – something that still stands out in my mind is I had a classmate who I frequently paired up with, a, a young lady who was a massage therapist, and uh, we became very good friends. And I, I had to drive up to Evergreen on the west side of uh, Denver. It was about a 45-minute drive to take these classes, and I'd drive up the Canyon Road. And in the class, I was starting to come down one night with uh, – it wasn't flu, but it was, you know, something I was congested. I was feeling bad. I, I really didn't want to go up there, but I didn't want to miss the class. I went up, and my partner asked me what was going on. I told her. Well, when I was driving home after class, I was about halfway home. I was in a canyon, and all of a sudden, I felt this tremendous wave of warmth flow over me. Just uh, so noticeable. I couldn't ignore it. It felt good. And when I went to the class the following week, I asked her if she'd sent energy to me in remote healing. And she said, uh, yeah, I did. And uh, once again, you know, I wasn't expecting it. it. It wasn't one of those things where I could make it up or anything. Uh, she confirmed that she had done it. So uh, that was also very notable to me in terms of uh, how the healing stuff works. And then uh, working with other people, you know, getting uh, – occasionally very remarkable results and a lot of times, you know, pretty good results where people would get, you know, acute pain relief and things like that. Uh, th those were good feedbacks. With the, um, what do you specialize in terms of uh, healing work? Now, you, is it, is it hands on or you do other type of, uh, or is it, you're doing a form of, of Reiki or uh, how do you go about it? Now, I'll give you just a, a little touch more of history, and then, and then you'll understand the answer better. Um, I uh, I left Lockheed in 2000, and Mark Maria became Lockheed. And uh, I went to a small renewable energy, energy company, and I was there for about three years, and I was trying to move forward with my, my training and everything because uh, I was getting pushed in, in readings, frankly, from spirit to I need to go do something. And... In 2003, I won some contracts with a company out in California to do R&D work for the Air Force. And so I was able to leave uh, the engineering company. And I literally hear a voice in my head said, okay, you have all the time you need. You have all the money you need. Go learn everything you can about healing. 
And so for the next four years, I took many different protocols or modalities. Uh, I went to acupuncture school for two terms, decided it wasn't for me, but gave me a good background in Chinese medicine. I did two years of psychic mentorship with a medium here in Denver. Uh, I did theta healing, the UN method, uh, the healing touch program. I went all the way through that and became certified. Uh, Matrix energetics, which looks at more quantum uh, quantum physics concepts for how healing would occur. Uh, I did Psyche, which is working with subconscious core beliefs. And uh, in there also I started um, having access to the Akashic Records. They came through to me very clearly. So in answer to your question after a, sort of a preview there, uh, I'm a very eclectic healer and I can be working with people hands-on or I may be working with them where I'm looking at subconscious core beliefs with Psy K. If I'm doing Psy K, I may get a hit that I need to go look at the Akashic Records and I find past lives where they had uh, something that has similar injuries or pain or aches. Um, and I end up walking them through scripts to release their energies from having that energy bleed over into this lifetime and giving them symptoms. So I, um, gosh, and some people I even find that they have connections to other selves of theirs in parallel universes. And traditionally, that wasn't an issue. But in the past two years, I've started seeing that show up where um, one of their parallel lives is having a rough life. And they're sort of reaching out and making their life, the one here, uh, have pain, aches or pains or other uh, anxieties. And so we go and we work on the other one in the other universe. And then come back and get rid of the energies in this universe. So I'm, I'm a very eclectic healer, and I, I've never set much stock on just one approach works. I, I found that the universe kind of uh, has a way of uh, punishing hubris. You know, if you go to a healer and the healer says, I, I can make sure you're cured by the time you leave my office, and my system always works with everything, Boy, either one of those statements is just setting yourself up to get slapped down and uh, being taught a little lesson in humility and uh, gaining more understanding. So I, I'm I'm a very eclectic healer. Uh, I work with uh, what comes to me. Now, Dave, you just said something that's very interesting to me. Now, are you saying that our selves in a parallel life? Now, I understand the concept uh, of multiple parallel universes and um, something that we're actually playing around with in our investigations uh, these days. But the if we're living a parallel life, that can actually have an effect on what happens to us in this one, both physically and maybe psychologically? Yes. Let me give you a little bit of background. Uh so the, the listeners uh, can come up to speed on, on where we are here real quick. Uh, one of the solutions in quantum mechanics to explaining the theory of everything is that there are parallel universes or a multiverse. And what I have found, I, I believe this is true because I, I've had validations for it. So the, the basic idea here is if you, Mark, are going along in life and uh, you make a major life decision such that you're going to marry Betty, and uh, as soon as you do that, uh, from my point of view, you spin off a couple other parallel universes for Mark, where Mark may marry somebody else in another universe that would have been a possibility and may have stayed single in another one. So one time I asked my guides, I said, well, based on this, if uh, does that mean that there are 10,000 other Daves out there? And they said, no, it only takes two to 300 to cover all the options. So, okay, so I'll accept that. So. Uh, once again, where's the validation for this? I had a fantastic event happen one time. Spirit seems to put me through uh, one or two times things to demonstrate these things to me. So I have a friend who's, uh, she's intuitive, but she's a wonderful artist. And she she had her stuff uh, coming up to a gallery showing. We have these things out here called First Friday. So it's a Friday night and um, the first Friday of the month. And it's just walk around and see things. And she was had she was in a store that was in uh, sort of an outdoor mall, and it was an art store. And she was going to be one of three artists who was highlighting their work. 
so she said, could you come to my showing? And I said, sure. And so my wife and I went, and it was from 5 to 7. We showed up about 5.30. We found the place. We walked in. Well, my friend's name is Sophia. There's no Sophia there. Well, we look around. So we find her work. We look at her work. No Sophia. We, we, uh, we look at the other artist's work. We, we sample the goodies there. We don't drink, so we just had water and carrot sticks. And there's a photographer there for the store owner taking pictures of the guests. And uh, after 45 minutes, we thought, well, maybe she had an emergency. We didn't ask. And I always wonder why I didn't ask, but we didn't ask. And so we left. And that night, I sent my friend Sophia an email. And I said, you know, that's pretty cheeky of you to invite us to your showing, and you don't even go yourself. Well, late the next day, she sends me an email, and she says, Dave, I found your email very interesting because I was there in the studio the whole time. And she said, based on your email, I went back and met with the owner, and we went through all the photographs from the photographer, and you didn't show up in any of them with your wife. So it's huh. like, okay, so I've experienced now one of those things where uh, sometimes you see them in books where people say, yeah, it was a terrible storm at night. I was driving home. I was scared I wasn't going to be able to make it. I found an exit ramp, took the exit ramp, got to my house real easy, told people about the route I took the next day, and they said, there aren't any streets there. There's no neighborhood there. And they take me out and they show me. And uh, so I, I had one of those things where I was in a parallel universe that's very close to ours, almost indistinguishable, except that. Sophia and my wife and I did not meet up. So and, <laughs> that was very convincing to me. But, you know, it, it, this begs the question, okay, if you branched off and were in another another parallel universe at the time, but now how did you how do you merge back into this one where obviously she was there and she remembers it? Uh now, now, the idea of parallel uh, universes is not new to us. I mean, this is something Irene and I have talked yeah. about because uh, she has experienced a couple of different versions of me in her, uh, with air okay. quotes, I say, travels, where I like I don't smoke. I don't smoke at all, never have smoked, and yet in one of these uh -huh. universes she deals with me, I smoke. <laughs> now, there's a, something worse, Dave. You said that there's hundreds of these, hundreds yeah. of you around, hundreds yeah. of Mark. Oh yeah. my God, I could not tolerate that. Well, you know what? Something there's tells a, me I'm. There's a Mark uh, multitude. <laughs> oh God Almighty! <laughs> something tells me I'm you know, annoying you in a majority of those. So oh, suck it. Yeah, and you know, there's some, there's one there. There's got to be one out there where I'm a good girl. Yeah, uh, that mm. that that sounds more fantastical than the multiple universes. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm the naughty girl and the paranormal. Because you're in, you're incorrigible, but yeah. you, you know that that is again that's an interesting. <sighs> When you try to think about what happened, and again, I know some there are some things that are just beyond our comprehension, but to be able to slip in and out of a parallel universe, you know what? Yeah. Usually, you would think that that would you would need a hell of a lot of energy to do that uh, <laughs> to go between universes like that in the physical. But Irene's laughing at me, so I, I think I just said something silly to her. Well, I am the one that can go days and nights without sleeping. Yes, that's true. Um, but but what are your thoughts on that, Dave? I mean, when you, you obviously were somewhere where your friend wasn't, and then now you come back, do you feel like you've slipped in through something like a portal or something, someplace where the realities intersected, went different directions, and then came back? Is there any telltale way of knowing when an event like that happens? Uh, a lot of things have happened to me where I don't know that they happen until after they're done. But um, I'll give you another example. I, you know, people talk about the veil being very thin between realities now and the veil being very thin between us and the astral plane or the spiritual plane. Um, 
a, a model or a metaphor that I have for these different realities is that they're like big round rafts floating on a river and occasionally they bump up against each other and you can step over and you can step back. Um, I had another one like that where um, my wife and I and uh, my daughter and several other, um, I think, family members from uh, my daughter's husband uh, were with us and maybe it was before they were married. We were in line to see a 3D show in the uh, atrium at the Luxor Casino out in Las Vegas. That's the one that looks like a big pyramid. Right. And uh, so we were, we were stuck in line. We're waiting in line. I'm looking around, and um, I'm a big, tall guy. And uh, because of the hot sun out there, I, I had a, a straw cowboy hat on. And I look over, and about 40 feet away, there is me. There is my doppelganger. There is like looking in a the mirror. There was another Dave there. And I couldn't get out of line to go talk to the other Dave. And uh, eventually, we our line moved, and he wandered away. And uh, once again, I like validation. So uh, two or three medium friends that I, I really trust, I said, what was that? Was that really another copy of Dave from a parallel universe? And they said, yeah. And what's more, uh, we see it happening some more times where – uh, temporarily, these uh, different realities overlap, and you know, you can easily step back and forth. So, um, that that was another one of those uh, confirming experiences for me that there are things out there that that fall into this. Well, again, that is actually we've talked about this a lot on this show, and you know, with a little bit of our background, Irene and I have both been ex uh, investigating the paranormal uh, for many, many years between us, and uh -huh. you know, one of the things that we're looking at is cases of what most people may consider to be traditional ghost. Uh, experiences or hauntings may not be at all. It might fall more in line with this uh, uh, veil between the worlds where whether parallel worlds merge or possibly even time, you know, there's the idea that all time is happening at once and our concept of right. linear time is, is just an illusion because it's just how our brains work. Uh, but right. Time. If all time is happening at once, then uh, you know we've we've told stories numerous times about uh, Irene or seeing an apparition that reacts to her as just as shocked as as uh, she was to see it, or people saying yeah. that. And you know we look at it that it's not seeing a ghost of somebody who's died. It could be more along the lines of two very much alive. Living, breathing people just happen to be able to see each other mo momentarily through that rift in time and space. Yeah, I, I had a funny experience in that when I was uh, uh, really getting into meditating and discovering who I was uh, back in the 2004, 2005 time frame. And I went back and I was shown a past life where I was a little Hindu holy man out in the woods, you know, in a hermitage. And I approached him and it was introduced by the spirit guide. And, you know, this is um, Sri Ananda. And uh, so I said, well, it's so nice to meet you. Uh, you're one of my past lives. And he busts out laughing. He goes, oh, no, no, no. You're one of my future lives. And, and that really, once again, forced me to, you know, reevaluate, you know, my perspective. And, you know, it'd be the same thing that you're talking about where you may run into surprised people who temporarily step into our reality and, um, they're surprised to see you just as you are to see them. That's interesting. That's a very fascinating concept. And yes, there is the whole mm. idea. Pe people spend a lot of time thinking about, oh, past lives. They want to know who they were in a past life, not not even thinking that, hey, you know, there's also the future lives, too, because they're all happening at the same time anyway. Yeah, yeah I, I'm absolutely, I absolutely believe that our past lives are still in play. I've had the, under spirit's direction, I've had to go back and change three of them where I was burned to death for being a heretic to kind of shut my mouth and uh, do it on the sly. But I also think that we occasionally have visitations from future selves that may come to see us and say, please don't do that stupid thing you're getting ready to do because that will have influences on me down the road. Wait, and, uh, so, so you I, just said I that think all going on. you just said that you have been able to go into a past life and affect the outcome? Yes, absolutely. 
Wow. Now that is a mind-blowing concept. I don't believe they're fixed. I believe that they are still ongoing, and we we can get into them. Uh, and once again, another confirmation in one of the Dolores Cannon books, uh, she has a whole series on Nostradamus, and when she started out with a guy who, uh, for some reason, energetically, when he was in hypnosis, he was tapped through to talking to Nostradamus through, uh, Nostradamus was using some type of scrying mirror, as we would call it, his magic mirror, yeah. uh, to get insights. And... Uh, they were feeding through this hypnosis questions to Nostradamus, and they uh, they realized they screwed up and had to change their protocol because they sort of let it slip and describe what an automobile looks like, and they believe that they found that a couple of his quatrains changed dynamically uh, when they did that. So they suddenly got very careful not to feed him any information about the future so they wouldn't distort his writings. Wow. <laughs> that maybe answers a lot as well, doesn't it? Yes, in a mm. lot of different ways. Well, well, then let me ask this. You had mentioned uh, earlier in the program about working a lot with the Akashic Records. Now, for those yeah. people not familiar, the Akashic Records is is kind of like a large spiritual library where everything in everybody's lives is recorded and all your past lives and even future lives is recorded and you can incur karma in one lifetime and you know your work you could work it out in another lifetime but where does that fall in now if all of these lives are taking place simultaneously and they're all still in progress, then how does karma really work if it's not linear? I, I view karma not so much as what goes around comes around. You know, you're going to get payback if you hurt other people in a lifetime. I view it more as um, it's sort of a, a report card on how well or how poorly you did on meeting your life objectives in a particular life. And you may get three A's, two B's, and an F. And you may say, well, okay, according to the report card, next life I take, or sometime down the road, I sort of needed to repeat that one lesson because I did so poor at it. I'd like to have another shot at it. So I, I view karma much more that way. Um, but I, I have a, a bigger view of karma now. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was showing how to burn karma, where I, I take people through a meditation and give them a visualization and we burn the karma for all their lives for all time. And uh, that's coming through to me because I'm hearing and talking to also, once again, validations from other mediums to make sure I'm just not uh, distorting this, that the concept of karma is, is going away because with whatever our near-term f- future is and how things are speeding up, uh, the spiritual realm realizes that we don't have centuries and centuries and centuries of future lives to go in and try every different perspective of uh, say you shot excuse me shot and killed somebody in this lifetime now in the next lifetime you take on the role of the person who got shot the next time lifetime after they take on the role of their mother or their sister or brother to see all these different perspectives um, I'm seeing I believe that that aspect of karma uh, or karma in general is is going away because we don't have the time to try it over and over and over like that so are you saying that time is getting short for humanity? Uh, I think we're going to see major shifts on this planet to other vibrational levels of Earth, and people uh, to a certain degree are going to be sorted out, and some are going to possibly go to a lower vibration, and a lot are going to go to a, a set of higher vibration Earths. And I think there's gradations there. So, yeah, I, I really do that's... think that some major things are coming. That's me and you, Mark. Down we go. <laughs> I hope to God not, because, well, this is I, this is the most unspiritual thing I'll say. I just hope that, you know, when we advance, the stupid people don't come with us. Because <laughs> there's so much of it, right? That's I, I posted something on my Facebook page today. is like my, my new daily mantra. I have to chant it every single day. Not my circus, not my monkeys. <laughs> to, 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 to lower my frustration with the way I see the world going these days. But, um, but, but you know, I, 
Uh, uh, okay, uh, I read I was you. Going to say, let, uh, I'll just carry on sucking my Cadbury's cream egg. Carry no. on, Mark. No, no, you had a question. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm still going to have a mouthful of Cadbury's cream egg now. Ah, fine, then I'll continue. <laughs> um, and, and you didn't share with the group, by the way. Uh, I mean, I Dave and I are sitting. Myself. I suck them myself. Dave and I are sitting here waiting for ours. I, I prefer the, the caramel ones, by the way. Caramel. <laughs> caramel. Speak properly, yeah, caramel. I, I'd heard uh, different versions of the whole vibrational rising. They talk about everything since from 2012, the, you know, the end of the Mayan calendar into the new age, yeah. and all this, and that the vibrations that you know people are still going to be basically in the same area, but maybe their personal vibrations are raising or lowering. But uh, from your perspective. Is it something where you think that people will actually vibrate themselves into another reality, whether it's lower or higher? Uh, I think it's already happening. I think the Earth is being depopulated some. I don't think the the people who do statistics or demographics maybe have noticed it or caught up to it yet. But... Um, yeah, I do think a fair number of people are moving, and in some cases what's happening is that their history is being changed. So if the family had uh, three sons, and then suddenly one day they have two sons, and all the pictures only show two sons, and that other son uh, was essentially you know, erased from from having involvement with that family and went to uh, another vibrational level. So, like, like Marty McFly yeah, in I Back to the I, Future. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it's it's already happening. And, you know, it's one of those things, well, how, how can you prove it's happening when all the traces of it having ha happened are gone? And it's like, well, I can't. I, uh, these are, you know, images, meditations I have. And once again, when I bring this up with other mediums and, you know, essentially look for truth pimples or other validations, then uh, pretty much I get them. So I, I do believe that we are going through shifts right now and the pace may pick up well that, that could in some ways it could explain the high number of disappearances of people who go missing every year with no explanation especially in our national park areas or wooded areas but that could be another phenomenon altogether there's also something that's known as the mandela effect are you familiar with that yes i'm very familiar with it. I, I've done some shows on that, too. Yes. So yes. that could possibly explain the, the whole idea of these parallel realities could explain uh, yeah. the mm -hmm. Mandela effect, whereby, like, um, there's one more famous one that I've heard. Well, there's Mandela himself. Because a lot of people remember, actually have memories of him dying back in prison, never becoming president. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. There are other stories of Kirk Douglas. I remember Kirk Douglas dying back in the 90s, and yet he's still okay. alive. You know, he's pushing 100 yes. right now, and he's still yep. alive. But I do remember his uh, hearing about his death many, many years ago. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, it, it just it's kind of mind-blowing <laughs> when you start to think about it. Now, now, here's a question from a spiritual perspective. So... We're here living our lives. Our souls are down here wearing these meat suits, and we're we're working out whatever karma or life plan or whatever we have. And yet there could possibly be another 300 of us out there all doing the same thing with slight variations. So yes. uh, what does that do for the concept of people who look at your spirit, your spirit in, is in, inside your body while you're alive? But um, are we talking about a fragmented soul? Or are we talking about, like, maybe the spirit sending out tendrils into all these different lifetimes into these bodies and these different realities? It's all part of the same soul and spirit, but um, it's like maybe on the other side, sending out like tentacles like an octopus into these different realities. I mean, how would you, yeah. how would you describe well, it? Well, if, if you think about you know, the source, the creator, God, however you choose to, to look at that consciousness and that reality, and then, uh, you know, one of the ways I try to explain to people on how I, I view it and experience it is, um, let's pretend that God is a big brain on a coffee table, and uh, the brain is self-aware, the brain is having thoughts and everything, 
but the brain has no essentially uh, inputs from the outside world. And so the brain one day comes up with an idea of sending out tendrils, and those tendrils end up looking like uh, what we would call either spirit or souls. And we give the illusion to the ends of those tendrils that they are separate from the brain, and they can look over their shoulder and have their own thoughts and observations and report on what it looks like. So the brain gets feedback through that and uh, experiences through that. Um, well, when you hear the you know the things where you know well we're created in in the image of God, you know another interpretation of, what, of that would be that whatever our soul or spirit is could also be in multiple places at one time and is not limited by our concepts of a three D world, and therefore. Uh, it can experience in in multiple uh, realities all at the same time, and you know not have a conflict there. So I I, I don't see a conflict here of the idea of you know we're we're, we're stuck with you know one reality a, at a time and and that's it. I when when I do Akashic Records readings for people and look at. Um, you know, I might get two past lifetimes where one is in 1780 and one's in 1790, one's in England and one's in South Africa. And the people say, well, how can that happen? And it's like, well, I found that sometimes your souls, even on this planet, can be very enthusiastic about gaining experience. And so your soul may be in multiple bodies at the same time, and there's no connection on the planet between those lives. Uh, each one is, you know, views itself as independent and moving on. So I am... I don't think the the rules are quite as fixed as some people think they might be, and I think that the rules can also evolve. And I think we're in a period of great evolution, uh, spiritually on both sides, uh, both our side and the spiritual plane. So, so not only could you be existing in multiple realities at once, there could be you existing in multiple people in the same reality. Yes, I. I believe that there are four other uh, physical incarnations of my soul right now. Um, I can tell you their rough life circumstances or where they are on the planet, but I would not make any attempt to track them down because they may be on a totally different path, and they might think I'm the biggest kook ball they ever saw if I showed up and tried to make contact. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it was another four of us running around. <laughs> it was bad enough the idea that there were multiple me's running around yeah. in different universes. Now there may be multiple me's running around in this universe. Oh. And to top it off, here's the real mind screw here: all of your past lives, there are multiple versions of you in those too. Yeah. yeah. So you could literally be have almost infinite number of yous running around the entire multiverse right now experiencing past, present, and future lives and and all these different realities. Wow. I think yeah, I need yeah. a drink. Well, it's it's yeah, mind well, blowing. Think, think about just Yeah, let, let's put in perspective. You know, if I walked up to you physically and said, where are you in there, Mark? And you say, well, I'm this body. And I say, well, that body has trillions of so, uh, cells. Which particular cell is one that you would say is you? And you say, no, they're all me. Well, wait a second. They, they have lots of different functions. Some are heart, some are brain, some are bone, some are blood. Which one is the real you? And you say, well, but they're, they're all me. They all work together. Okay, so there is a cohesiveness there of separate entities, and that cohesiveness is what you define as you. So now if we start talking about you... Uh, with past lives that are still ongoing, and we have parallel universes around us. It, it's like we have a cloud of marks, and that cloud works as a totality to define who and what you are and to give you the opportunity to grow and expand and even to pretend sometimes that you're separate from the Creator, even though when you return to Spirit, you know you weren't. Huh. I just wish I, I I could be in the lifetime where I have my crap together. Because <laughs> this lifetime, eh, I need some work on that. And, of course, then, again, maybe that's why I'm here. Oh, yeah, to give me trouble. Yeah, well, that too. But that that's one of the pleasures of life. 
Uh-huh. Let, let, me give you, let, let me give you another metaphor that makes this more fun. Um, okay. So you, um, you as spirit are walking around um, a Disney World. And you're looking at these different rides, and you're looking at the Peter Pan ride, and you're looking at Pirates of the Caribbean, and you decide you're going to essentially incarnate and go into Pirates of the Caribbean. And you get on the little boat, and it's in the dark, and you go down the ramp, and you splash in the water. Suddenly, you're in the middle of a pirate battle, and the cannonballs are flying overhead, and big booms, and and then you get into the town that's being sacked, and you see the prisoners in the jail. And you're just so totally immersed, you believe that this is your reality. And then you finally come out to the end of the ride, i.e. the same idea is you die, and you walk out into the sunlight onto the sidewalk. You meet your friend on a bench. He hands you a Coke. And he says, how was your ride? And you say, wow, that was really fantastic. I actually believed it. It was so real. Okay, so uh, then you're, you're at the choice of let's go find another ride to hop on here and go immerse ourselves in another reality or another incarnation then here's the big difference though is when you're on one of those rides if you have the experience that you would call enlightenment enlightenment all of a sudden puts you in a perspective where you can look around now you can see that all these things are animatronic you can see the wires and cables and catwalks and the hidden cables and speakers and lights and everything and everybody around you is still fully immersed and you're sitting there well i know you guys are immersed in this but you know, I can see how it's done, and it's a lot of smoke and mirrors. They say, oh, no, it's not. This is totally real. And you say, oh, well, I guess I better keep my mouth shut unless I run to other people who also are ready to start looking around this room and seeing what's really going on. And uh, so I use that as a metaphor to show people what enlightenment is like, um, that you, you suddenly get that perspective where you see the, the true reality of, of what you're experiencing in and you also allow other people to have to continue to have their experience because in most cases you can't convince them that what they're experiencing is is all an illusion or a, uh, a mirage huh i'm well, that's that's food for thought isn't it yeah my my brain's mm. going to be processing that a lot tonight <laughs> let me tell you you've yeah. given us a lot <laughs> I think, to think, I think about i will as well dave you also do house yeah. clearings yes yes Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What you've yeah. come up against? Have you come up against with anything really nasty, naughty? Well, it's uh, I'll, I'll, once again, I'll give you a little bit of history. Um, about mm. 2007, 2008, I was out in Las Vegas on vacation. My wife and I go to go to Las Vegas a lot. It's sort of an adult playground, and. Uh, while I was there, I got a call, and it's from a friend of a friend of my daughter. My daughter, uh, at that time, she has a master's in uh, psychology, and she's working in a psychiatric nursing home. This lady calls me, and she's a little bit distraught because there is stuff in her house, and due to her marital situation, uh, she's married a second time, and they have two little kids together who are under five, and then the other guy... Uh, she has a stepdaughter who's 16, and she said, there's no way I can let my husband or my stepdaughter know this because that would enter into the politics of who is the caretaker for the daughter. And I'd come across as a wacko. So I said, okay, I'll work with you. And uh, I was out in Las Vegas, so I was doing uh, looking at this house remotely, and she said, uh, well, here's, here's what I found out about this house. We got it for a really good deal, and nobody would tell us why. And it turns out that the, the previous owner had been an elderly guy who was a recluse, and he hanged himself in the basement, and nobody would tell us. And the phenomena going on, covers were opening and closing. Her little uh, young children were seeing witches fly out of closets. Uh, uh-huh. When she'd walk around by herself, uh, somebody would walk up behind her and say her name behind her head. When she was in bed, something would press down on the covers, and... You know, all the types of things which, uh, frankly, I have no desire of seeing. That just kind of creeps me out. And uh, so I went in and uh, just uh, kind of winged it on finding out what kind of energy was there. And I, sure enough, I found a guy, and uh, I disconnected that energy from the house. And I got feedback that for about two weeks it was good, and then it happened again. Well, Sometime before that, I also found I was given another gift from Spirit, 
of going down into hells that are illusions. Uh, I believe all hells are illusions. Yeah. Um, my my view is that if you die believing that believing in a hell that is concrete to you and you believe you should be there, uh, the creator says yes, and you can languish there as long as you want to. If I say, is this all there is? And then angels will help you get out of that illusion. Well, I, I found that I could go down to those illusions and uh, find people, clean them up, help them understand this illusion, and get them back to the spiritual plane. Well, what I found was uh, with this guy having committed suicide, he put himself into one of those. And from that artificial hell, he had maintained a connection to the house. And so I did another little clearing exercise where I got him out of that hell, got him back to his spiritual plane, disconnected all those energies, and all her problems went away. I thought, wow, this is pretty cool. So uh, I've always been gifted in this life where I can read a book on something and become an expert. And uh, I found one book by uh, Edith Fiore and uh, looked that over on uh, moving on earthbound spirits. And then over the following years, uh, I just developed a protocol where uh, if you look at my web website, uh, davidmystic.com, I have a worksheet. And I muscle test remotely uh, for clearings all these different things that could be in a house, whether it's earthbounds or large dark entities, uh, elementals, things like that. And um, so I, I, I clear can you, the can you, clear sorry. Uh, sorry, can you can you explain the muscle test? Yeah. Um, so you can muscle test other people. I found when I started doing readings across the table from people at fairs that uh, it, I couldn't put them on a massage table and test them. So I, I learned how to test both originally with two hands where I'd break a circle uh, with my fingers where if it was strong or true or yes, you can't break the circle and when it's weak or false, you can uh, yeah. to get a yes, no answer. And then I learned how to do it with a one hand technique. So originally I learned how to draw my right hand, but I couldn't write. So I learned how to draw my left hand so I can write with my right hand while I muscle test on my left hand on the behalf of clients. And mm -hmm. so uh, if I was going to uh, find out how many earthbound spirits are in a house, I would just test one or more, two or more, three or more. And uh, if three or more was false, I knew it had to be two. And I put that in the form. So uh, over the years, I, I've probably done over a thousand clearings and I, I do them all remotely. I, I yeah. found for my purposes that if the people demand that I need to go out and see the house, that they're not a client for me because uh, the few that I've had have been very needy and their neediness ends up, I clear it and then they, they invite in more stuff and then say, you didn't clear it all. Yeah. We've had, we've, down, yeah we've had a, a few like that cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I, I don't like to work with those, but you know, in terms of the, the strange things, uh, Gosh, uh, what I'm getting now is uh, I'm starting to find, I, I have a category called other, and other lately covers things that don't show up enough to be right their own place in the column. Um, but I find a lot of dark entities and things from other energy planes that are coming through. One that's come through lately quite a few times is something, you know, we all know the concept of a reptilian, you know, but that's typically viewed as like an upright biped. I'm getting these things that they're coming from another energy plane. They're, they're um, uh, sentient beings of some type, but they, they look like Komodo dragons. And I'm finding those in people's energy spaces in their houses. And uh, so that, that's one of the, the latest ones I'm finding. It's weird. Yeah. Um, Dave's I, I lizard removal. Yeah. Go ahead. You said that's your new business, Dave's lizard removal. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Trust him. <laughs> Sorry about my co host there, Dave. Carry on. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'm I'm fine with uh, that. That's eh? all right. I'll clip him around the ear later. Okay. You, you have the so, strange one there. Uh, so they're like I, kimono. I, I don't... Sorry. They're, oh, like, they're like these kimono dragons then. Yeah, the, the Komodo up. dragons are in South Pacific. Yeah, and, and these things look like that. And I send them back to their home uh, reality or planet, whatever it looks like, uh, to get them out of here because they're yeah. they're um, they're malevolent. They're they're not helpful, and uh, yeah. we don't need them here. So I send them back to where they came from. So how do you think they're getting here? Do you think they're slipping through some sort of portal or? 
Yeah, I think there's a, a big gateway that's open that uh, the good news is it allows people here who are evolved enough to travel through that gateway and go try other realities, other universes, uh, you know, whether it's in meditation and their dreams, whatever. But the, the flip side is I think a gateway has allowed a lot of things to come through into our reality that uh, aren't normally native to our, our space. Yeah, okay. And uh, do you ever get these, like, beings that kind of suck the energy? I call them clingers, like little, little mm-hmm. dark things. Yeah, there's there's things. I get a lot of things that, that look like um, eight-legged carriage wheels, sometimes with a rim, sometimes without, and maybe two to three feet in diameter. And I find a lot of those things coming through and attaching to people at the uh, the base of their neck on yeah. the backside and attempting to uh, manipulate their, their behavior, uh, sucking off energy, um, and... Some of those are, are difficult to remove. They're uh, they, they really get intertwined in the people. Mm. So, what what's the worst haunting, or have you had a really really nasty one? Uh, recently, uh, a lady uh, I mentor people one on one to train them in this, and I've trained about five people, and, and one of them called me up and said, "I helped another person clear, and I'm stuck with something. I, I need your help." And I looked at it. And it, it sort of looked like a, a 10-foot copy of a Godzilla, but it's made out of uh, black ash that drips and uh, maybe some molten lava. And she could not get it out of her energy field. And uh, I don't know where that came from, but ultimately I was able to, to get it away from her and, and send it back somewhere. Uh, but that, that one was, um, it was too strong for her with what she felt were her resources. Yeah. Yeah. Mark? Well, um, that's part of... Uh, Irene had run an organization there in the UK, and I'm working with it now to continue it, uh, called Spirit Rescue International, which uh, uh-huh. w- would do very similar to that, going into these locations that have these types of activity and you know helping to remove whatever it's there. Uh, to get it to go back where it came from or just move on, um, both, you know, locally and doing remote work. And, right. you know, the thing with energy, you know, you, these things can't be destroyed. Energy can't be destroyed. It can only change form. Sure. And basically, in the case of most of these things, it's just, you know, getting them to leave and pushing them out uh, to go somewhere else <clears throat> or go back where mm-hmm. they came from. Um you know, and the one thing here in the U.S., people, it's its mostly in the U.S. these days, people are obsessed with demons. The whole concept of demons yep. and all the horror, all the horror movie trappings, all the paranormal TV shows, just, just screaming demons, it's all demons. And yet, in reality, in the 18 years that I've been doing this, I've yet to encounter anything that I would consider to be a demon. Uh, it seems to be mostly hype, and uh, if they exist, it's it's um, much more rare than people realize. And even then, they may have a more of a mischievous spirit or something else going on, but because it scares them, oh, right away, it's a demon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I identify things around people's energy field that I call demons, uh, from my point of view, most of them seem to be, even though they can be big and powerful, most of them are uh, in some sort of uh, in, inactive mode. And the impression I get is that they're waiting for an age of the person to happen, a date, or an event to activate. So uh, I found these where they're um, inactive, uh, even in very young children sometimes. So I see them there. Um, do they do they do phenomena? Well, I think for me it's a toss up between them and these things called large dark entities that are, are big, very dark, very powerful. But they they have the mindset of about four or five year olds, so they they work best with people who are very suggestible or don't have impulse control. 
uh, like prisoners and stuff, you know, where they, they cause them to do crimes because they, they don't know how to stop and think. Um, so my, my experience has been there. There, um, I think overall Denver um, has a yin and yang character. I mentioned we have lots of light workers here. Well, I think the yin and yang and the, the balance uh, also brings in a lot of uh, dark workers here. And there, there are uh, satanic churches in New York City, and there are branches of some of them here in uh, the Denver area. And uh, one of the things I do is I work on removing curses, and I've had some people show up who've been the target of uh, curses done with animal sacrifice from some of these churches against them. So um, I, I see some pretty dark stuff out there. And um, generally, I, I move on to the spiritual plane to... Uh, have it taken care of. We, we've had the opportunity to meet and, and interview and get to know people who have gone through some horrific uh, negative hauntings. Um, uh, I'll give yeah. a sh- shout out to Tony and Deborah Pickman. You may have heard of them. They, uh, <clears throat> back in the 90s, while they were living in Kansas, they dealt with a they lived two years in this house that had incredible amounts of negative um, energy uh, where Tony was okay. being attacked daily and being scratched. The old uh, sightings mm-hmm. television show on Fox did several episodes on them. And while they mm-hmm. were there filming, they had things happening right in front of the camera. Uh, they called it yeah. the Heartland Ghost, and you know now we call it the Sally House Haunting. And they moved out of that okay. house... Uh, and things things were really really bad till just before the end. They moved out of the house. The current owner rents the house out for people to go in and ghost hunt, making some money off of them. And yet sometimes yeah. this thing, whatever is there, will still torment Tony. Will still attack him if people go into the house and stir it up. He sometimes still suffers the repercussions of it. Um, yeah, and. Uh, Yet nobody has really done anything about it. You know, it's they. Everybody wants to go in for their experience uh, of investigating, and yet nobody really handles the situation to prevent it to, to keep from happening. That's because it's a money maker. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You know, when they got money, when someone's got a money maker, they don't want someone going in there and clearing it out, do they? Nope, not really. But then when you have people like Tony mm. who continues to be affected by it. Yeah, but is he making money from it? Nope. nope. No. No, he's no, he's he doesn't live there anymore. He and his family have Oh, been he doesn't. Out. No, he he and Deborah and his family, they've been away from well, there for 20 if, years. If he's if he's still, if he's been affected by it, it's more than likely something else that's attached to him other than something from the house. Maybe it came originally from the house, but yeah. whatever's in the house is still there and he's got something else, that, you know? I think it's still it, it's an interesting but this thing is brought forward. Yeah, it doesn't bother them all the time. But if it's somebody goes into the house doing, they've said they've gone to the house, and they, if they stir things up, if they're provoking or whatnot, he sometimes will get attacked, even though yeah. he doesn't live there anymore. But it doesn't happen all the time. So it's an interesting case. I mean, mm. uh, we 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 still get occasionally we'll get uh, cases from people. They'll talk about where they're seeing black shadows moving through the house. They've seen like a tall, sure. tall uh, shadow figure, very imposing looking, moving through the house. Uh, we have one client right now I'm talking to who they feel it's coming from the empty house next door. That a lot of things have started uh-huh. to happen within the last year or so. Um, uh, we we've dealt with uh, cases, um, long term investigation cases, where we've felt it was the land that there's something of an elemental nature or nature spirit. If you're dealing with something going yeah. back with a lot of Native American activity on a land or property, mm-hmm. and people we've we've investigated multiple houses on the same street. Can you see that? That, all right, I know we deal with that, but that is more common in America than what it is in the UK. What, on the elemental side? No, the problem being on the land. Well, are you you sure? Because you guys also have very long history of fairy lore. Yeah, I know. And all of that, which is basically an element. Yeah, you get all that sort of elemental stuff, yeah. But, you know, 
with Nat- you've got Native American Indians. We've got plague burial grounds, but we don't have any problems really from them, not so much as what you do with your American Native Indian burial grounds. Well, well no, that's a different subject. I, I take issue with the fact when everybody says, oh, our house was buried on a Native burial ground, and that's why we have all this activity. Mm. And, you know, that's one of the things I call baloney to because, you know, Native American burial ground, white burial ground, you know, Jewish burial ground, they're all burial grounds. The only difference is that sometimes I know the Native cultures would work more directly with spirits for protection and whatnot, but there also may be more, I feel, something more of an elemental type nature in land and property. And then when they build houses on these properties and encroach on the natural territory of what these things may be there, that it, it's an open recipe for some things to start happening and bothering people. I don't know. What, what's your thought on that, Dave? Uh, I, I agree with you. One of the things I do in clearings is I check for uh, grave sites, but the intention is they're grave sites that have some type of shamanic protection left on them that needs to be released and told that, you know, that's all done, it's it's over. Um, but that, that also leads to another thing. When, uh, when I go to natural history museums and other places that have collected Native American artifacts, uh, and something I started doing several years ago is, I just start picking up energies from some of the artifacts, and when I do, uh, I essentially uh, clear them and desacralize them, so now they're just an object. They, they don't have uh, a shaman's connection to them still, because uh, to me that's that's sort of the same idea. Like you know, if you're uh, you know if a congregation is done with a church, then you know they can go through a, a ritual to desacralize that building and uh, you know return it back to just an ordinary building, and so. Uh, I do that at museums when I, I come across objects that, you know, I'm sorry, that's got a buzz, that's got an energy in it, and uh, uh, I just don't think it's appropriate to put it on display if it has that energy. And since they aren't going to put it away into a storeroom and just on my word, then I, I go ahead and clear it. Hmm. Uh, in in your experiences with with the paranormal, I mean... Uh, have you only just gone in and doing cleansings? Have you gone and done any other type of research? And, you know, what does your analytical mind think of with you when you're dealing with these types of beings and spirits trying to rationalize? Do you ever have a um, a problem where the left brain and right brain are, brain are crashing into each other, trying to come up with an explanation? Not, not really, because it, it's been an evolutionary process. My my worksheet started out with about four or five columns of things that I looked for, and now it's about up to 15 or 18 columns. But uh, here's a funny one, because we're talking about graveyards. Uh, I had one client who had a big house about a half a block away from the Fort Logan National Cemetery, and this is one of those big national cemeteries where veterans are buried. And um, what was happening, they had teenage daughters, and uh, frankly, dead soldiers were coming over from the cemetery to scope out the daughters in the basement. And... Um, <laughs> So not only did I do a clearing on the house because it had a whole lot of things, and um, that was one of the houses where they forced me to go out and see it, and I had to learn how to start saying no to that type of stuff. But um, in the process, I went ahead and uh, I found I can go ahead and do a, a wholesale uh, clearing of a cemetery and move all the earthbound spirits back to a spiritual plane. And uh, so I started doing that, and. Every couple of years, I, I go to the cemetery and I'll find two or three hundred earthbound spirits at Fort Logan and uh, move them back to the spiritual plane so they won't they won't be lost and they won't feel like bothering people. A long time ago, I decided that uh, when I when I would hear about teenage kids wanting to go out to some cemetery, you know, for late Friday or Saturday night with a case of beer and flashlights and cameras trying to to see things, I, I thought that's too much of a circus and a freak show and. So when I start hearing about cemeteries that would have that going on, I, I'd go ahead and clear those cemeteries so there'd be nothing there to see. <laughs> Spoil, Spoil their fun. <laughs> I'm going to scare Mark now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I have to what, laugh what about it? the soldiers going into the basement. Par- uh, we've got paranormal pervs. Yeah. 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 When, when Mark was in Colorado, he went to an old um, graveyard. Uh-huh. Okay, and I was on Skype with him at the time, and he was talking. And there was a couple, you had a couple of people with you, didn't you, Mark? Yes, we were doing a training I session. Didn't, yeah, I didn't tell him at the time, but while I was on Skype and listening to them, I was seeing 
all these people walking around. I think there was okay. Mark and a couple of people actually in the graveyard, wasn't there? Yeah, there how was. Many were you, it was. How many of you were there? there I was were, seeing about thirty, forty of them. No, yeah, there was only two, uh, four of us, and it was still <laughs> daylight. I was seeing. <laughs> but I didn't tell him because I knew that it would upset or worry him. What do you mean it would upset and worry me? Well, I kept it from you. You were with people. You don't want people well, bloody shiting themselves because I've said something over well, Skype. Well, okay, on that aspect, I could agree. The yes. other the other people, yes, but me? I look. I would look around. You tell me that, and I would look around and go, well, oh, okay. I didn't think no more of it after that. You know, it's like when I went into that hospital, I'd done that hospital, and I cleared that. Uh, the amount of people that came through from there was unbelievable. I just don't think anymore. You know what I'm like. I see something. I don't even bother with it afterwards. They <laughs> don't tell you anything that goes on. Argue with me, mister. <laughs> that, that's a around the face. That's she, what you'll get. Yeah, well, she's, you're sitting there thinking, oh, I could scare Mark. You, you know, like, when? I don't no, get scared. I didn't want to scare you at the time. I don't get scared. I didn't want to worry. All right. Maybe scare is the wrong word. I didn't want to worry you at the time. It wouldn't worry Because you had people with you. Yeah. Well, that's fine. So, that's fine. Because I know you're big and you're brave and you're not frightened of anything. Well. I know. I, I am. Yeah, I do get frightened. I get frightened of the living. You're running into somebody. I mean, uh, we we had a group once where we were uh, investigating a cemetery about 10 years ago, and uh, we found a, a drunk passed out on a grave, and he woke up and pulled a knife on people. So Ooh. Uh, I'm I'm more worried about the living than I am the dead, trust me. Uh, so am I. That's why I... <laughs> or, or in my neck of the woods, running into either A, a skunk, which I have, or B, a bear. In which case, yeah. I'd be going the other way. Oh, all right. <laughs> um, well, and all all of our cemeteries here in the Denver area have uh, uh, lots of foxes. Uh, they they den in cemeteries because they aren't disturbed and they can dig down easily next to the monuments. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I love I love critters like that. So that's cool. <laughs> um, well, let's see, we've got about seven more minutes left. Uh, one question I have for you, Dave. You've done a lot of studying and learning about all yeah. this, but before you started to learn about it, did you feel that you were you had any psychic or in, or abilities, or you were intuitive at all before this happened, or you just started meditating, working on it, and started building it from there? Well, when I started with the therapeutic touch, I thought, well, I can sense things with my hands. My left hand is, is very sensitive uh, to picking up energy fields on people. Uh, I wasn't really clairvoyant even today. Uh, I get flashes of clairvoyance, but routinely, no. If I see an aura, I just see a white band around people. I don't get the big technicolor display like a peacock. Um, but when I really started focusing in, in 2003 and 2004 and really started meditating, uh, I started out with uh, guided meditations where you go to the meadow, there's a little shack, you walk into the shack, there's somebody sitting across the table, and they show you something or give you a name or a message. And uh, after about a week and a half of that, they started taking my hand, and I started zooming to other uh, planes with them, and they took different forms. And then, once again, a really neat validation is uh, I started exploring uh, the basic level in the spiritual plane and looking at the buildings and going in them. And the coolest thing happened because I came across one of Sylvia Brown's books where she had gone to that area and she'd had an artist sketch the buildings, uh, what she described them when she came back. And I recognized half the drawings because I've been to those places. And I thought, wow, that's a really neat validation for this in terms of journeying and uh, you know, traveling. And uh, so starting there, then then things just really opened up for me and and getting the Akashic Records downloads. I, I started out with a book that would open to a page and there'd be a picture on the page and then it would become a video and I could move it forward and backwards. And then after having done that for a while, then using the metaphor of the library of the Hall of Records for that uh, and having clerks there hand me books to advise people then it just has gotten to the point now where 
as soon as somebody asks me a question, I, I get a rush of information and I can tell them who, what, when, where, and why uh, for, for the Akashic Records. So um, very much clairsentient abilities, uh, occasionally clairaudient, but the, the clairsentient, you know, I set the intention and the, the information just washes over me. So that, that's kind of where it comes. But yeah, initially, other than thinking, well, I could sensitize my hands and feel energy fields, uh, I really didn't think of myself at that point as being that much of a psyche. And see, and see that's something I've struggled with because uh, I may have mentioned to you I completed the um, the shamanic training with uh, Jim and Roxanne with Sacred Hoop Ministry right. this year. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> you know, part of that is learning to journey and doing the journeying. Yeah. And whether it's meditation or journeying, I struggle with it. I struggle to turn off my monkey brain to get into that altered state of consciousness. And um, it's still something I'm working with. It's, 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 I, I just can't tune in sometimes, I, whether it's because of the environment or because of what factors, I don't know. So it's still something that I'm working on because I feel like I just don't get anywhere. Now, when it's come to the point of me actually doing healings, I could feel the connection. Um, yeah. It starts to happen naturally. Uh, sometimes even talking with somebody about it, I can feel it starting to kick in. But uh, just trying to journey on a subject or look into, like like one of our cases, trying to look into it remotely, um, it, it's very hard for me to connect. So I wish it came yeah. more naturally. Let, let, let me give you a little helpful advice, and this might work with some of the listeners too. Um, I've never been good at shutting down my brain and you know, eyes closed or eyes open. I'm in a Zen-like state viewing a gray wall. I've always been somebody who does work in meditation. I don't go in there and try to blank everything. But the trick I use when uh, I'm getting ready to meditate and, you know, you have those things about, well, i got to pay this bill today. i got to remember to call the doctor, have to go to the store and all that. Uh, what I tell people to do is, uh, do you know what a, a monkey island at the zoo looks like? Yes. It, it's, it's a little island with a moat and... The monkeys are on the island, but they don't need to have bars because the monkeys won't cross the water. In your mind space, create one of those where you have an island with a moat around it. And every time you have one of those monkey mind thoughts, put it on the island. Uh, I believe those thoughts have a consciousness, and they resist being wiped out or killed, so to speak. They, they become very hard to do it that way, so I don't do it. I just put them on the monkey island and say, you guys can all play together. I'll come by occasionally and wave at you. And uh, that becomes a very fast habit, and after a while, uh, all these recurring thoughts that get in the way, uh, they, they quit happening. Because if they do, you just put them on the monkey island and come right back to where you were. You aren't sitting there trying to think, how can I get this darn thing to shut up in my head? You know what I do? I see whatever's well, going through my head on a blackboard, and then I get an eraser, and I just wipe it out. Oh, good for you. Mm, so whatever that's, how I, that's how I do it. Similar thing. Very similar mm -hmm. in a way. Is, is that the reason yeah. why you can't remember my name half the time? You, you just well, erased I it? I erased that a long time ago, <laughs> mate. <laughs> Yeah, she'll go to introduce me for the show. It's like uh, my host. Uh, wh 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 what's your name again? <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Well, uh, Dave, actually, we've, we're coming up here on the end of the show. I want to say this has been br a brilliant discussion. You've really opened our eyes to a lot of different possibilities. Uh, now, how Good. can people get uh, a hold of you? And uh, you do have a website, right? I have a website so they can see uh, some of my services. It's www.davethemystic.com. Uh, I'm happy to take emails from your listeners. My email, the, the best account is dbarnett, D-B-A-R-N-E-T-T, -T, at holistic, H-O-L-I-S-T-I-C, beliefs.com. Uh, I even welcome phone calls. You know, if I'm available, I will talk, and that's 303 902 and um, I, I'm happy to work with people and uh, I do a lot of healing work I do a lot of things with core beliefs I do a lot of things with Akashic Records uh, do karma burning uh, clearings uh, all that type of thing so I'm happy to work with people if, if they have a need
And just to remind people, Dave lives in Colorado. That's mountain time. So people be aware of the time change when you call. <laughs> Don't call at 3 in the morning. Uh, thank you. Well, thank Dave, you. thank you for, for being on the show. This has been great. Well, thank you for having me. You guys are a lot of fun to talk to and to work with, and uh, I sure appreciate the opportunity. I'm sorry about the arguments, but I will get in with a wet lettuce around the head later on. Promises, promises. You your beard on him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank our listeners for tuning in to another edition of Paranormal UK Radio here on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. And as usual, you can find us everywhere, so we'll catch you all next week. Uh, Irene, have a great one. Yeah, Andrew, well, whoever you are, and bye, Dave. Goodbye. Good night. Yeah. Bye, everyone.